When people come to the Lord as a second option for the needs that they already had before they came to church, they're setting themselves up to have a disappointing relationship with God. Thank you for tuning in today. My name's Frankie Mazapika. The title of my message is Jesus Offered More Than Lunch. He offered more than lunch. In John chapter six, there was 5,000 people following him. And they were watching the miracles. They were in awe of the miracles. Jesus was such a good communicator that without a microphone, people were leaning in. 5,000 people. And at a certain moment, he turned around and he saw that they were hungry. Now, Jesus spent most of his time around the Sea of Galilee. Now, around the Sea of Galilee, uh, these were what I want to say uh, common, common people. They were not intelligent. They were not rich. They did not make a lot of money. They were fishermen, and they were in need a lot. It, it wasn't like the people in Jerusalem. The people in Jerusalem, the people in the city. Now, these people made... Uh, a good living. But he spent most of his time around the Sea of Galilee where they thought about how they were going to provide for their families. They, they thought about how they needed income. They had children. And so Jesus turns around and he sees them hungry and he feeds them 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. And he feeds them. It's, it, it was the greatest fish fry in the history of mankind. And so he keeps on walking and he starts noticing that wherever he went, these multitudes were with him. In Mark chapter three, verse 20, it says this, that the multitudes followed him so closely and so often that he didn't even have time to eat. So it's not like the 5,000 just showed up on Bring a Friend Sunday. They were always there. And so they're following him around and then he realizes this. He turns around and he goes, okay, okay, I, I see why you're following me. And this is in, in John chapter six, verse 26. He says this, he goes, you are following me not because you want to be with me, not because you're interested in the grace that I have for you. Not because you're interested in the relationship. Not because you're interested in the partnership. The, you have the same wants, the same desires, the same needs as you had before you met me. And, and now you have the same things. He goes, you are not following me because you want to be with me. You, you do not understand the meaning of the miracles. And so it's a, it's a troubling thing when one Christian tells a person who's not a Christian, hey, I know that you're struggling with money. Just become a Christian, believe in Jesus, and he will take care of all of your financial needs. It's a, it's a struggling thing when a person is sick, they're fighting for their health, and a Christian comes up to a non-Christian, he says this, okay, come to church, become a Christian, and the Lord will take care of your health. It, it, it's, a, it's the same need, it's the same want, it's just coming from a different source. It, for the person who's single uh, that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, a person who does have a relationship with the Lord may walk up to the person who's single and says this, if you just become a Christian, if you start worshiping, the Lord will take care of all that. He'll make you Don Juan DeMarco, the greatest lover who ever lived. You will be gorgeous. Women will love you. It, it, it's like, come on. You had the same priorities, the same hopes, the same desires before you were living with Jesus. And now you're coming to Jesus and just saying, I have the same hopes. I have the same desires. But now I'm just looking to you to take care of these things so that I don't have to because I'm not able to. And when we do that, this is the Lord looking at you and I. 
Just like he looked at the 5,000, he looked at the 5,000 and he says this, look, I just gave you lunch. I provided for your needs, but I can offer you more than lunch. He looks at you, he looks at me in John 10, 10. He says, the thief, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come to give you life and more abundantly. And so he goes, I, I see your needs. I see that you have needs before you came to me. They're important to me. But I don't want you to come to me just because you have the same needs, the same hopes, the same desires as you did before you come to me. I can take care of that. I will take care of that. But I want you to come to me not for those things. I want you to come to me for the grace, for the relationship, and for the partnership. Because when we come to him and just say, look, I'm coming to you because I have financial needs and this is my last resort. When people come to the Lord as a second option for the needs that they already had before they came to church, they're setting themselves up to have a disappointing relationship with God. I'm showing up just for another reason. The Lord says this, I know you're hungry. I have more to offer you. There's three things that the Lord offers that oftentimes we overlook. Number one is the grace that he wants to introduce. Number two, he wants to introduce a relationship that we cannot even imagine exists. You got to remember we're talking about God. We're not talking about a friend. We're not talking about a best friend. We're talking about God. Like, let's, let's just get that in our head for a minute. In Corinthians chapter one, verse 14, uh, I'm sorry, 16, uh, no, let me go to 17. All things are held together within him. Within him, there's galaxies. Within him, there's planets. Within him, there's everything. There's nothing that's ever been made There's nothing that has ever been made that isn't within him. The way your heart, your lungs, your liver, your veins, your bones, it's all held together within him. You cannot get into an Elon Musk rocket and go outside of God. Everything is in him. This is who we're talking to. And he's saying, I want a relationship with you. I want to talk with you. I want you to feel my presence closer than you feel the shirt on your back. So he wants to introduce grace. He wants to introduce a relationship and he wants to introduce the partnership that he has with you. So let's just dive into the first point. He wants to introduce you to grace. The Bible says in Romans chapter 9, verse 23, it says this. I have called you, not because of your good or bad works. I haven't called you because you have gone four days without sinning. I haven't called you because uh, you're doing really good and you're kind and everybody else around you is not kind. I haven't called you for that reason. I haven't called you just to rescue you because you're a sinful person. I haven't called you because of your goodness or for any other reason. I've called you because I love you. This is the Lord looking at you and saying, I have a grace that surpasses your understanding. It's a grace that says, I know all of your weaknesses. And I I just want you to know, I knew you were going to be weak in those areas before you were born. I looked ahead. I saw everything. And my plan is not so feeble that your mistakes can knock my plans off course. He already knew. And so he he says, I have a grace for you. And this grace is so powerful. Ephesians 2, 9, he says this, it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. 
His grace is powerful enough to snatch you out of sin, pull you away and say, you're going to spend time with me. You're my son. You're my daughter. That's how powerful grace is. I recently read of a a young boy uh, boy, uh, sitting in a waiting room with his father. He had broken his finger. It was in a lot of pain. And he was sitting there and there was another guy, a stranger in the waiting room. And he looked at the young boy and he says, come on over here. And he picks him up and he puts him on his knee. Now the father could look at his countenance. He saw that he was a kind man. And so he he just allowed the whole thing to take place. And so he looks at the young boy and he says, what's wrong? He says, I have a broken finger. It hurts. I can't use it. And the man looked at him and says, what about if I just cut it off and and I can replace it with a perfect golden finger? And the little boy grabbed his broken finger and he says, no, I want my own finger. I don't want a golden finger. I want my own finger. It's almost like the Lord looks at you and he looks at me and he says this, I'm not replacing you with somebody perfect. I will bind you up. I will set you in place and strengthen you. I'm not replacing you. The enemy tries to convince us that there's no difference between weakness and wickedness. You see, weakness is whenever we say something or we do something and we back up and we say, Lord, I know that that may have hurt your heart. I don't want to do that anymore. Help me to be stronger. That's weakness. The enemy comes along and says, no, 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 your weakness is wickedness. Jesus comes along and says, I see that you're weak. I'm not getting rid of you. I'm going to bind you up. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you courage. I'm going to raise you up with my victorious right hand. This is, this is how God is. This is the grace of God. He looks at the 5,000 and he says, I have more than just the ability to give you your lunch. I have more than the ability to kind of arrange a marriage or open up a door so that you can make more money. I I can do more than the needs that you had before you met me. See, people who come to the Lord oftentimes have the same needs, but it's a lot like saying, I was shopping at Walmart, but now that I'm not shopping at Walmart, I'm gonna go to another store to buy the very same things. It's like, I was on my own, but if I become a Christian, I'm expecting to just get everything from another source. The Lord says this, look, I'm gonna introduce my grace to you. And then he says, I'm going to introduce a relationship with you. It's not just the Lord looking at you and saying, I will strengthen you. That's, that's, not, that's not where it starts or that's not where it stops. It, he comes to us and says, I want to be close to you. And in Proverbs chapter eight, verse 17, there's a verse that just should encourage all of us. Where the Lord says, I love those who love me. And those who seek me will find me. It's it's his way of saying, I don't want you to get discouraged when you say, I want to be closer to you, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. He's saying, "I, I know who you are. I know you love me. And if you seek me, I promise you, you're going to find me. And when we find him, we, we can't get away from him. So when we find him, we're actually becoming closer to him. It's just however however close you are with God, just know this, there's always more. I I was reading about Adam and Eve and um, I I started studying uh, Jewish history. It was outside of the Bible. It's a book of history. And so uh, these these Jews started writing, uh, you know, the story that got passed down from generation to generation. And when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, 
The Lord put an angel with a flaming sword to make sure that Adam and Eve could not come back into the garden. The worst part about getting kicked out of the garden is they could no longer feel the presence of God like they could before. But the second worst part, if I can say it that way, is that they're looking at the Garden of Eden while they're cast out of the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine how, how horrible that would be where you're tilling up ground, but you're looking at fruit? You're looking at the garden. I went on a tour to Alcatraz, uh, the big famous prison. It's on an island. And I was going through the tour and the guy that was going through the tour said, the worst part about being locked up in Alcatraz is you can see San Francisco. You can see the lights. You can hear the horns. You can hear the music. And so you're seeing freedom, you're hearing freedom, you're hearing laughter, you're watching life move on, but yet you cannot be a part of it. And that was worse than being behind bars. Adam and Eve was looking at the garden. There was an angel blocking. And so history, Jewish history says that he found a cave and he decided to himself that he was going to dig through the cave down underground and come up on the other side and be in the Garden of Eden. It's almost like he's saying, I see the angel, but he'll never catch me. I'm going to go under the angel. He'll never know I'm there. He'll be swinging his sword, but I'll be behind him. And as far as God is concerned, I'm just going to sneak up. He'll never see it coming. So he was digging and he's getting close. He was getting close. But then the Lord spoke to him and said, you've, you've come far enough. Stop. And this is the God who looks at the ocean and says, you can roll waves, but you have to stop right here. Son, you can come up, but I'm going to tell you when to come down. Earth, I'm going to allow you to spin, but you're not going to move. This is, no, no, no. The world, the earth does spin, right? It goes around the sun. He looks at the sun and he says, I'm going to allow you to burn, but I'm not going to let you move. How about that? Does that make sense? Woo, that was close. And so Adam had to stop and Adam stayed in this deep depression. But his great, great, great grandson would come into this cave because he lived in a depression. And Adam told him about the Garden of Eden. The only way we know about the Garden of Eden is because Adam told the story to his children, his children's children, his children's children. He lived for 633 years. And so Enoch was in the cave. He's listening to his great, 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 great grandfather. And he's telling him what a relationship with God is like. It's not like a relationship with people. He's not like your best friend. He's not like the closest person you've ever met before. You can feel his presence like you feel the wind. It's just not blowing. You just know it's there. It's like feeling heat on a hot day. You can't touch it, but you know it's there. It's like walking through the snow and you're cold, but you can't touch the cold, but everything has completely changed. It's like feeling the presence of God in a way that you cannot explain. Catherine Kuhlman, one of the greatest healers in American history, God used her to heal thousands, probably millions. And she was being interviewed and she says, you must understand. She has this strong accent. She goes, you must understand. The Holy Spirit is closer to me than you are. This is what a relationship with God looks like. And so Enoch says, well, I didn't know that that was possible. And I believe that if you had a relationship with God that way, I can too. This is why your testimony is so powerful. And he began to pray and pray in Isaiah 63, verse 2 and 3, I think, 636. Six, 
No. 626. I, I don't, yeah, it's 626 because I remember my favorite car back in the day was a Mazda 626. So <laughs> Isaiah 626, it says this, those of you who pray, give yourself no rest until God gives you what he has promised you. So Enoch starts praying. He's given himself no rest. He breaks through those moments where he feels like he's talking to himself. He keeps on praying even though he feels like God is a million miles away. He wakes up the next day and decides he's going to pray anyway, even though yesterday was boring. He keeps on praying even though his mind keeps on drifting. He's just not going to stop because what he desires is far more than anything he can see. C.S. Lewis said this, if nothing on this earth can satisfy you, then you must be made for a place other than earth. And so he backs up and he says, I have to keep on praying. And then there was the breakthrough. Charles Finney said this, many people faint before they receive their breakthrough. He refused to faint. And so he had his breakthrough. And many of you know the story where Enoch walked with God. He talked with God. It wasn't a dialogue where God just listened. It was a conversation back and forth. And when you have a conversation with someone, you're sharing your dreams, you're sharing your hurts, you're sharing your desires, you're sharing your wants. You're completely transparent. And God does the same. Where he shares his thoughts, he shares his feelings. When Abraham was walking with the Lord, God told Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah is so sinful, I'm going to destroy the whole place. God was telling him his plans. Abraham backed up and said, God, please don't do that. I believe that there's some righteous people in there. And God said, well, I don't know if you can find some righteous people. Maybe I can figure this out. Maybe we can find some type of a compromise. Do you see what's happening here? God is sharing his thoughts. He's sharing his plans. And Abraham is giving God a different perspective. They're just having a conversation. The Lord's plans didn't change, but he was open for a conversation. And then he realized this, look, I'm going to blow the place up. I'm sending sulfur. I'm sending lightning. But the people that you're thinking about saving, okay, go get them. It was a conversation. Relationships have conversations. And so the Lord's saying this, he's looking at the 5,000, he goes, I can offer more than a meal. He's looking at you and he's saying, I know that you're desperate and your desperation is, it, 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 I'm passionate about it. I can exceed your expectations, the needs that you have. I'm glad you came to me because I'm the one who can take care of you, but I'm ready and I want to do more than just feed you, than just open up a door financially. I, I, th th there's, there, I want to introduce you to grace. I want to introduce you to a relationship. But then there's a partnership, which, oh my goodness. I'm not uh, like, uh, are you kidding me right now? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord says this, I will keep you strong so that on the day that Jesus returns, you will be found strong and holy and righteous. And then God says this, and I will do that because I have called you to be in partnership with my son. If you and I go into business and it's 50, 50, we're in partnership. If if you and I uh, go peek behind, a, 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 what do they call that? You know, we're the pilots of a plane, a cockpit. If you, if you look into a cockpit, you see two people there. They're partners. A husband and wife, they're partners. 
The, the, a, a, a team, an athletic team, they're walking out there. They're partners. And the Lord says this, I've called you to be a partner. A partner with my son. I've, I've called you because what my son wants to do, I want you to do with him. I don't want you to stand up and watch and admire. I want you to do it with him. Uh, when I was uh, a small boy, I was about eight years old, and, and I was riding my bike, and I fell off my bike, and, and I skinned my face up, and I wasn't ready to see my own blood yet, and, and I remember being afraid, and a mailman came up to me, and he, he got out of his car, and he lifted me up, and I'll never forget this. He said, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. He puts me back on my bike. He sends me on his way. I needed Jesus that day, but I needed a Jesus with skin on. I needed somebody to hold my hands. I needed somebody to pick me up. And Jesus says this, I see my boy, but I need a partner. And he sent the mailman over. When God looks at you, he says, there are needs, but I need your help. Come on. I need your help. Did you know in 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, when you pray, Paul said this, when you prayed, you strengthened me. Do you know that when you pray for people, they get stronger? This is why the enemy does not want you praying for people. He'll tell you not to pray. It's not going to, it's not going to make a difference anyway. He'll do whatever he can do. Don't pray. They're too far gone. Bible says when you pray for them, they get stronger. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, he says this, I want you to desire the best gifts, the gifts of healing. I want you to desire these things. The, the ability to walk into a room and know that there's something not right in this room. There's something's not right. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, there's a devil in the room and you have the authority to cast it out. I want you to take care of business. Yeah. Satan, get out of this room. Get out of this house. Stop whispering to me. I don't belong to you. Get out of here. Open up the back door of your house and say, in the same way you came in, I want you to leave in Jesus' name. That is partnering with God. I want to show you a, a video real quick of somebody being healed. And, and the reason why I do this is I've got to remind myself. I have to remind you that miracles still happen. I talked to a friend of mine years ago and he says this, he goes, I don't believe in, in those healing and the miracles at the end of the services. I love the worship. I don't mind the preaching. <laughs> he goes, but it's the healing, it's the miracles at the end that I have the hardest time with. And I said, I understand you're, you're a linear thinker. You're logical. Don't worry about it. At the right time, the Lord will confirm within you that what you're seeing is true. But before the Holy Spirit ever confirmed within him that it was true, something happened to his son. And he was going to go to the doctor or the hospital. But who do you think he called first? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how we don't believe in miracles or healing until we need one. I want to say this, that if you can say to the Lord, Lord, if you can help my unbelief, I'll be ready to partner in greater ways. Just help my unbelief. And I believe that this video will increase your faith. Take a look at this. Hi friends, my name is Jason Handela and I've just been dealing with sciatic pain for the past, like just months since like December. It's been really painful hard to walk. You know, I've been coming to uh, Celebration Church for a while now, and I've noticed that, you know, Pastor Frankie just prays for people after service, and I've been just kind of just waiting. I'm just like, Lord, like, you know, one of these Sundays is going to come, and just really glad that today is my day. You know, like, Pastor Frankie got up there, he talked about 
Uh, anyone dealing with sciatic pain or hurts to walk, I've been dealing with that for like the longest time. And I just immediately went up. I'm like, this is my day. Got up there and um, yeah, he prayed. Um, at first, um, I started feeling just like, uh, like coolness in my hand. Um, and then uh, the pain just started to go away a little bit. Um, he asked me, you know, how it was, prayed again, and uh, the pain went almost completely gone. And then he prayed one last time, the pain is completely gone. I can move, I can walk. I mean, Jesus is so good, and I'm just so honored, and it's, it's my day to be healed. So praise Jesus for that. Let's all stand to our feet for me, please. And I'd love for all the prayer partners to come down. I spoke to someone the other day. They said, I came down and prayed with a prayer partner, not because I was physically sick, but I, my marriage was all messed up. Just a few months later, after years of difficulty, the hearts of both begin to turn and warm. I don't know what miracle you need today. But I will say this, that it is just as easy for God to do a miracle in your life as it is for you to breathe. It's that easy. And so we're going to open up uh, the altars and I'm going to invite you to come out of your seat. More physical healings happen from prayer partners and from me. And so whatever your need is, and what I've learned is all of us need a miracle. They might look different, but all of us need a miracle. I'd like for you in a moment to come out of your seat and pray with a prayer partner. But I'll say this to the person who is far and away the most important person in the room. This is a very critical day. The most important person in the room is the one who knows. Deep down, nobody needs to tell you this. You know that if your heart were to stop beating in the next five minutes, you don't know where you'd spend eternity. You're the most important person in the room. The Bible says that if you're ashamed of Jesus in front of man, he'll be ashamed of you when you stand before him. And so I want to challenge you to come out of your seat, take the hand of a prayer partner, let them pray with you. If all of our prayer partners can kind of shift down, it's a bit uneven. Um, we got a lot more down there than over here. Ushers, if you guys can help me with that each Sunday, that'd be nice. So I want to invite you to come out of your seats right now. There's no official dismissal. You can leave whenever you get ready. But I want to encourage you, let's sing this next song one time through before anybody leaves. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May his countenance be lifted up on you and bring you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.